across not only the state of Kansas, but the United States that feel that it is much easier to destroy than to preserve. And really that's what this is a story about. It's a story about not only preserving um, our people's history, but also our buildings and our places. What I know about Quindaro is that it is a melting pot of culture. Um, that it was a boom town that lasted for a very short time, about six years, uh, down by the river. Um, it had multiple um, um, things that it was trying to carry out. It was founded by a European by the name of Abelard Guthrie. Um, but it, depending on who you talk to, he wasn't the most wholesome of characters. <laughs> Um, he didn't have any good intentions, but still doesn't change the fact that he was there and that he started that town. He named it after um, his wife, whose name was Say Quindaro. That's where the name come from, and Quindaro interprets a uh, bundle of sticks, our union and strength, and the Delaware means daughter of the sun. Both are pretty names, but if you have one stick or twig uh, that's not very strong, you put them in a bundle, they're hard to break. Quindaro was founded on the concept of helping blacks escape from, from slavery. So it was a free port town. Um, it, was, it was actually settled by a diverse set of people. So not only were Native Americans involved, there was also white developers. And then the blacks came into the town too. So it, it was a safe haven. Slaves came uh, that old rock house down there, as you go down to the cemetery and go, uh, and it, it's a big white rock building. That slaves came up through a, a, some kind of thing underground. One of the, the newspaper editors, she had a cistern, which is a place where you hold water, and she helped put, she put um, escaped slaves in there. This was just an incredible little town that. Uh, some people wanted to see snuffed out. <laughs> and so they didn't uh, renew some of the licenses that it takes to be a, a town. And so it just kind of slowly um, sucked it dry of resources in that way. And then also the Civil War came along. After the end of the Civil War, there wasn't as much of a need for it in its, in its state, even though it had started turning into a bustling town. But an economic depression that didn't hit not only just Kansas, but across the United States, had a huge impact on Quindaro. It didn't last very long, but while it was going, it was a boom town. <laughs> it was booming. My great-great-grandfather, his name was Robert Monroe, who was a slave in Clay County, Missouri, who escaped in 1856 and settled here in Quindaro and homesteaded property here uh, with the help of the Wyandotte and Delaware Indians. Quindaro has been a, it's been quite a uh, experience, you know, growing, growing up in Quindaro. Uh, years ago, it was quite a community of, you know, black people. It was a, a time of segregation, but then it was also a good time because everybody was like a family. Families was more together, you know. If the parents needed to borrow a cup of sugar from the others, you know, you just went to the neighbors and got whatever, and you never locked your doors in those days. And it was just, uh, Everybody was kind of like on one accord. Unfortunately, uh, Quindera's made a vast change. There was hardly anybody that you didn't know when I was growing up here in this area. Now, I can't tell you who my neighbors are right now to this day, even across the street from me, our next door to me. You know, we're hoping, I'm hope, at least I'm hoping that one day that Quindera will come back the way it used to be. And, and, that, and that's the feeling, and it's too bad that it can't, it, that it really couldn't be that way again, that people couldn't be that close together because we were really a close-knit community. The other part of Quindaro in terms of black history is they started one of the first schools for blacks in this area. So if you were an escaped slave, you, knew you could also go there to get an education. So that is one of the running themes through the Quindaro era, not only in the beginning when the settlers 
had that in mind that education was going to be first and foremost, but that carried on all the way up until the 1940s when Western University closed. And it was one of the first black universities west of the Mississippi River. And it's the only black uh, university that was ever in the state of Kansas. Uh, of course, there was Western University out there. We all went to Burnham School together. Our grade school took from uh, kindergarten to the eighth grade in the one building. When I left Vernon School, when uh, when I graduated from the eighth grade from Vernon School, I went to Western University and went and uh, spent four years there. When Western University started, 99% of the African American colleges were in the South. There were very few north of the Mason-Dixon line. Matter of fact, there were only three. It was Wilberforce University in Ohio, which was the AME College, which is the oldest, uh, well, one that's privately on, and you have Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, and then Western. The freeway that came through uh, divided the close-knit community of Quindaro. Uh, a lot of people, of course, had to, to move uh, because that was a strong, uh, viable community prior to 635. But the freeway just, uh, it just really broke the community up. It took a lot of the housing out, and a lot of people moved, had to move, you know, to uh, give up their properties, you know, to for the freeway. And then it even cut off part of uh, the Quinder Park even. So, you know, it's the thing that, that's why it just split Quinder up, you know. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. Lord, I love thy habitation, the place where thy heart dwelleth. It took, it took a lot out of us. Our church, Allen Chapel, for an example, had had a membership of 500 people. It dropped down to like 130. Well, naturally, it, it, just, it just cleaned it out. I mean, clean pe you know, clean people out of the community and things. So really, it, it ain't nothing out in Quindare now. The people uh, who make those decisions, the senators and the representatives, they see it as progress. And it's almost a total risk disregard of the people who live in the area. Sometimes when neighborhoods don't appear from the outside to be prosperous, Organizations or companies come in and say, we have an empty plot of land and we're going to do something with it. BFI was going to just, uh, they were going to put a dump down here near the Missouri River, you know. And we had found it out at a very late measure because we had gotten notice of it that they were going to have a special use permit meeting in December of 1982. What happened is that uh, Bishop H. Hartford Brooklyn, which was the bishop of this district, came in with all that vacant land out there and he was trying to find some use for it. And so we spent a lot of time uh, looking at the land. He brought a person there here from South America who looked and said, what can the land be utilized for? And, the guy, and they paid the guy $25,000 to come and he spent a week. And he finally came to the conclusion that it could be developed, but the cost would be prohibitive for the EME church. And so then that's when BFI approached them about make it into a landfill. So in December, early December of 1982, we had well over 800 people or so pack into City Hall in the uh, commissioner's room there. The people came, well went to the city, it was then at that time a city commissioner's meeting when they, uh, after they decided to try to get them to not pass it. However, because it was passed on to the commissioner of three, which was the mayor and the two other commissioners that served with him. It was up to them to make final sanction as to whether it was gonna happen or not. To some degree, it was almost lucky that the, this um, city of Kansas City was part owner of that because then they had to 
follow the state laws which required them to do an archaeological dig. And in that dig, they not only found objects, but they also refound the history of the neighborhood. The ruins that we passed all the time is the one that we passed when we were going up to attend our property that was up on, on the hill, which was by the uh, cemetery up there. And it was one of the ruins where they had bought the slaves into that house, and part of the ruins is still there. But at that time, we used to go inside of there because a couple of our friends and their dad lived there. I had a relative that lived in that uh, part of the old ruins. It's still down there now. I had relatives that lived there. And I uh, spent the weekends down there in that house when I was a kid. A while back, and I remember being one of the young people that did this, we excavated that area. And uh, we dug and uh, dug up old artifacts. And we collected a lot of stuff. And it's actually being housed now in the Historic Society of Kansas. And they're gonna keep it until we have some place to put it. A lot of people have cooperated to make sure that these artifacts end up at the Kansas Historical Society. And this includes cooperation from the descendants of Quindaro, people who are associated with Western University, uh, Unified Government of Kansas City and Wyandotte County, who I already mentioned, the archaeological contractor, Larry Schmitz, and then the agency itself. So there was a lot of contention about the fate of these artifacts, but people came together to make sure that they could put in a, be put in a repository where their story could be told. Uh, the uh, Western University Association, we're thinking about building a, uh, well, I'm on the board, and uh, we're thinking about building a uh, archives building down where the Douglas Hospital used to be. And if we could get that built, uh, you know, that, that would probably, well, it would add a lot to the community. It looks as though there's not much down there to see, but a lot of it was re-earthed uh, to preserve it because we couldn't afford to preserve it any other kind of way. So we know where they are. We have maps that can tell you where those foundations are and we can unearth them. I mean, it's not a whole lot, um, but there's more there than it looks like right now. And so we want to do a, a national parks and trails through the ruins and connect it to geotourism as well as other uh, underground railroad sites across the country. So when I think of an economic opportunity, there's very few places that are as rich in history and as ripe for opportunity that Quindaro has. So I think the most important thing that Quindaro has right now is it has a great opportunity for growth. I think that we need to look um, to partners federal, um, state, and local to put this on the agenda for making Quindaro a reality. You do have uh, 635 who runs right by there. There's a easy access to the area. So I see housing, uh, uh, businesses, development, uh, entertainment, that whole area. Everybody seems to know about Quindaro. And this is riverfront property. This is the last frontier, northeast, Economically is the last frontier. If you look at the map in the metropolitan area and you look for vacant space, this is the only place you're gonna find it, in the urban core. We need a lot done out here. We've, the development that goes in the west part of the, of the city has been phenomenal. They've got the legends. They've done an excellent job out there, but we've gotten passed over. Economic development has been seen in Wyandotte County and regionally as the infusion of public and private partnerships. Um, there was an emphasis uh, about 16 years ago now to uh, focus a lot of our economic development and to have the state and uh, the local government partner to offset some revenue that would have been generated um, for the development of the western part of Wyandotte County. Right now to, to talk about, we don't even have a grocery store nearby. I have to drive at least uh, several miles out of my comfort zone, out of my area, to go to the grocery store. What we haven't had yet is a grocery store that would serve the Northeast. The old Kroger that was at 18th and Parallel has long been gone. Uh, the Apple Market that just closed at 7th and uh, State Avenue um, really was not a great store anyway. I mean, it probably needed to close. It wasn't, um, I think people deserve a first class grocery store. So you have a huge area. If you take from 18th Street East and from State Avenue North, you have a, a huge area without a grocery store, a great food desert. And if, and the reality is, is if the free market saw an opportunity there, they would have already built a grocery store there. 
And so it's a challenging environment. I, th I think what happens in most cities in urban areas, there's reluctance to put money in uh, to urban areas to do some things. I think that's my own personal feeling is that it's an area probably if it was further out west, if it was reversed and say at 125th, it would have been developed. But I think that that's not done because of the location. But right now, we're still tearing down more than we're filling up. And what happens, that's genocide as far as I'm concerned. You're killing my community when you spend more to tear down than you do to fix up. And that is actually happening in Quindaro right now. And any city where you see that happening, you're going to see the destruction of a community. And the city is the biggest participant in the destruction of Quindaro. And so when I think of, of communities that we need to focus on, Quindaro is one that comes to mind immediately. Um, Quindaro was at a, there was a time when, when Quindaro was thriving um, through multiple times throughout its history, um, thriving as an African-American community and settlement. Um, the Quindaro Boulevard area then in the 1920s and 30s was very strong, even into the 40s and 50s. And then it began a decline that was really mirrored by a lot of our community. I think that much of what happens, you know, I think of what will happen is due to exposure. There's several websites on Quindaro now, several websites uh, even on Western University or on the AME Church and its involvement, the African Methodist Episcopal Church and its involvement in this area. Um, there are some of the greats from Vernon, Bishop Vernon and, and his struggles here to many of the people who have brought us thus far uh, by a certain faith and a clinging belief that we can do and we should be uh, proud of our history. And we should extol it and we should share it with the world. If you don't preserve your history, who will? You can't leave it to somebody else to do. Carter G. Woodson said, um, that whoever loves you should be able to tell your story. And he thought that in some situations, that you know, in some situations and cases that even black people were not necessarily the best uh, teachers or instructors of our children because some of them wanted so much to be other than black um, that they would not be good teachers for our children. By the same token, a lot of white people who truly empathized with what we had been through and truly loved and wanted to support might be excellent teachers. So from that, I agree with them. I think that whoever loves you, whoever truly wants to empathize and, and support you, um, and wants to see it from your eyes. You know, they don't want to impose um, their point of view, but they truly want to see it from your eyes and help you to move forward. That's the person who should be able to, who should tell your story.